After I made Lead Like Aragorn, I got tons of comments requesting similar videos for other characters. Some of those are planned for the future. But first, I wanted to address a great leader from one of my personal favorite childhood movies. And that leader is Li Shang. Now, before you get in the comments and tell me how I'm pronouncing Shang wrong, I know. But dang it, I didn't spend three years studying Chinese and having proper pronunciation drilled into my head just to throw it all out the window for a YouTube video. So I'll be pronouncing it Li Shang, just like the real life Chinese general that lived in 200 BC. And you can deal with it. Plus, that's what his dad calls him. I believe Li Shang will do an excellent job. Shang is an inexperienced leader who has just been promoted to the rank of captain. And as a kid, I totally missed the undertones of potential nepotism. Be careful, Captain. The general may be your father, but I am the Empress Consul. And oh, by the way, <laughs> I got that job on my own. Whether he was truly qualified or just got the job because of his dad, this is something that happens a lot in real life. That is, people are promoted to leadership positions without a lot of leadership experience, and then they just have to sink or swim on their own. And oh boy does Shang swim. He swims. So let's take a look at what makes Shang a good leader, where he struggles, and how you can mimic the good parts even if you have almost no experience. Right from the start, Shang needs these recruits to respect and follow him. And many people overcorrect in this situation. They try so hard to prove that they're in charge that they come across as insecure. I'm Michael Scott, and I am in charge of this place. Shang avoids this, but before he even takes command, there has already been an all-out brawl between his own troops. So he does two things. First, he gives them a logical and related consequence. You'll spend tonight picking up every single grain of rice. This is also exactly what you're supposed to do as a parent. Research indicates that spankings and even timeouts can often make behavior worse, not better. But when the punishment is a natural consequence of the action, then behavior improves. There may be no better example of this than the principle of you made this mess, so you have to clean it up, which is something I have done to my kids many times, and it's exactly what Shang does to them. Second, he makes it their collective responsibility. Now, this is where things get controversial and is probably his biggest failing as a leader, is this scene. Okay, gentlemen. Thanks to your new friend, Ping, you'll spend tonight picking up every single grain of rice. Collective punishment is when you punish an entire group for the actions of an individual. It's historically most commonly used in sports teams, schools, or the military. It is also a war crime, according to the 1949 Geneva Convention. Hilariously, this has led to students going online and complaining that their teachers are committing war crimes, which indicates that these students don't know what a war crime is. In almost every case, using collective punishment in a classroom is ineffective, but not a war crime. What the Geneva Convention is talking about is Poland kicking every German-speaking citizen out of the country after World War II, not the whole class getting more homework because Tom kept making pirate jokes. War crimes aside, the idea of punishing an entire group is that it will cause them to self-monitor and support each other. Some of the only times it can arguably be effective is in the military or other tightly knit teams where you have to be able to rely on each other in life or death situations. This is because collective punishment is about raising the total level of the group and not having individuals excel. Because the group will be rewarded or punished based on the performance of the weakest link, it incentivizes high performers to actually go back and help or support that weak link instead of advancing their own interests. It's about bringing up the collective average, but at the cost of your high achievers or your best behaved individuals, which can easily lead to resentment and a whole lot of other issues. Generally, it's not a great idea, but really, none of this matters. 
because Shang didn't use collective punishment, even though it looks like it at first glance. Everyone participated in the brawl and in making a giant mess, so they all deserve to be punished. They should have to clean it up. However, Ping slash Mulan's fellow soldiers try to make her a scapegoat to avoid consequences, which leads to the greatest leadership failing I see in Shang. This line, right here, after they all blame Ping. Okay, gentlemen. Thanks to your new friend, Ping, you'll spend tonight picking up every single grain of rice. He lets them get away with making it Ping's fault. They all still got punished, but he accepted their excuse. Here's an example of how it could have gone better. Using my super accurate, definitely not horrible Shang impression. I don't care who started it. You all chose to participate. And now you'll spend tonight picking up every single grain of rice. Now it doesn't feel like collective punishment, and it's clear that they aren't going to get away with making excuses. All of that aside, he did quite well at making it clear that he was in charge without overdoing it. Over the course of this training montage, there are a few ways he helps his troops learn to respect him, and it all starts with converting the rebel. Anyone who acts otherwise will answer to me. Ooh, tough guy. Yo. Thank you for volunteering. Retrieve the arrow. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best strategy, because it can backfire, but it is a strategy. As a leader, if you can get your most vocal opponent on your side, it tends to make everyone else hop on board. I actually know some magicians who use this exact same tactic when performing. They'll try and find the biggest skeptic in the room and then have them come be the volunteer. If you baffle the skeptic, they will rave about you for days. In Shang's case, he has wisecracking Yao. I'll get that arrow, pretty boy. And I'll do it with my shirt on. He calls Yao out and uses him as an example to make everyone else fall in line a little better. But the fact that he calls him Yao, calls him out by name, is perhaps an even better leadership lesson. Because it shows that in the one night since he has been made their captain, he has tried to learn their names. And that is impressive. Now on to the most iconic song ever. The next great leadership lesson here is one that we see fairly often in the media, but it bears repeating because we don't always see it in real life. You never ask those you lead to do anything that you wouldn't do. Everything Shang asks the recruits to do, he not only does, but he does first. He shows them that it's possible and he shows them how to do it. If you're shooting fruit, Shang shoots first. If we're throwing rocks at each other, he's the first target. Need to run carrying buckets? Shang leads the run. Unlike this little sack of garbage who's riding a horse and still judging everyone. This is huge. One of the biggest issues both at school and at work is when employees and students are given a new task and then just told to go do it and ask for help if they need anything. But it's scary and intimidating to ask for help sometimes, so people often don't, and they just fall behind. But even with Shang showing them how and leading the way, Mulan still falls behind. Which leads us, perhaps most importantly of all, to this line. As a kid, I thought that was just brutal. A scathing insult. What I realize now is that it is compassion. This is Shang caring about his men. Because war is brutal. And sending someone out into it who isn't ready is sending them to their death. So when he tells Mulan to pack up and go home, that's a mercy. Sure, it's dishonorable which is a big deal in that time and in that culture. But at least you're not dead. This mercy comes in again with the last lesson we learn from Shang, which is the lesson of balancing justice and mercy. Justice is a crucial part of leadership. If there are going to be rules, there have to be consequences, 
and those consequences need to be applied reasonably. Obviously to us, with modern sensibilities, killing someone for impersonating a man is awful. But the premise here is that it is the law. You know the law. The law that Shang is duty bound and sworn to uphold. In this case, Justice says she has to die. But Mercy says, she just saved you and probably all of China, so you should be putting her on your shoulders, carrying her back to the Emperor and singing her praises. Given the circumstances, he makes a pretty solid call. A life for a life. My debt is repaid. Move out! Uh, uh, but you can't just... I said, move out. He spares her life, but he provides a good enough justification and is harsh enough in his punishment to her that Chifu probably can't get him tried for treason or anything. It was a crappy situation, and I think he did a pretty decent job of balancing both, all things considered. Bonus content! The villain, Shan Yu, also shows us some great leadership traits. Instead of micromanaging his men and telling them what to do at all times, he asks them compelling questions and gives them the freedom to find creative solutions. How many men does it take to deliver a message? One. While you're here, check out this playlist of all the other Lead Like So-and-So videos, and make sure you leave a comment about what other famous leaders you would like to see highlighted. Now get out there, make the world a better place.